Dr. Power, you oh, the ride. Thanks, Chassie. What's new in your life? Oh, getting ready for convocation. Convocation this week. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, convocation's coming up this week, and uh, it's nice to see another uh, truckload of MBAs walk across, stumble across the stage. Your turn's coming. I'm looking forward, and I'll certainly be there cheering you on in the, in the back row. But uh, looking forward to it, folks. Uh, anyway, come on in. Yes, Andrew, have a seat over here, and Serge, and uh, Sue, and Paul is one here. Paul, I liked you kicking off last week, the post office. That was uh, was good. And uh, Lee, Clarence, Will, there's one more seat over here. Will, and uh, your materials on the civil service last week got a, a pretty good run, too. So thank you for that. Anyway, folks, let's get underway today if we can. Uh, this is week five. Uh, week five, we have uh, finished the context case of uh, of a, uh, the Sleeman's case. And hope we got some mer some materials out of that, much like the Robin Hood case. Uh, we're going now into the Royal Rose Goes Global case coming up this week, which is another context case that we look at things like modes of entry. And all these context cases are to help you sort of offline to work with your colleagues to practice some models, some tools, rehearse some of the questions, get comfortable with it all uh, for your individual paper. And your individual paper, of course, it is individual, but I don't mind you talking to your colleagues about it. Uh, I don't expect a cone of silence. Sit and talk, learn by talking to your colleagues, what tools are they going to use, what issues do they see. As long as it's you writing, I don't want to see a cut and paste of everybody in the same, in the same team giving me the same answers. So make it yours, uh, your voice, your stamp on it. But there's nothing wrong with uh, spending some time talking to your colleagues with the individual papers. So I encourage you to do that. And the purpose, again, of context cases and working our way up gradually into this, on the final exam, it consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is a series of short snappers. Um, six uh, questions, you must do five. Uh, I've finished designing them, they're up now, they're in the hands of the exams department, and I'll talk more about them as we go along the road, but there's one regular exam for the bulk of you, but for those that cannot write on the day appointed, there's an alternative exam, which is similar format, but different questions for those folks. And the questions uh, that I put on there is, uh, I think there's a Sun Tzu uh, quote um, that uh, asks you to respond, and. There's no right or wrong answers, folks. It's what does it mean to you in the context of strategy or your experience, what you bring to the table? Um, what do you get out of that saying and how, how, how can you make it apply to your experience? Uh, Peter Drucker, uh, I think I've got Drucker in there. I admire Drucker. He taught till he was 92 down at Claremont in the States and uh, very much idolized. In fact, I have a cup autographed by Peter and uh, say quite a feat to teach till, till 92, so good for him. Um, there's a couple of uh, short statements by other folks or passages, but nothing too onerous. There's say no correct answer. You're not looking at giving it exactly what do they mean to you in the context of what we've discussed in this course, the cases we've studied in this course, uh, your environment, what you've lived with out there in a strategic concept, and that's uh, half, the, half the exam. The other half of the exam is on the Monday prior to the end of week eight, I will send out to you the actual names of the exams. They're in your textbook. And again, I encourage you, nothing wrong with this, sitting down with your, with your team and uh, looking at it, reading the case, and asking your team members what tools they would use. But in this case, where I've given you the questions all along to save you a little bit of time in doing all this, uh, there are no questions. Uh, you make your own questions. I'll give you the questions on the exam, but there's no pre-questions on this thing. You have to determine what questions will that old fart give us, and you work on that side of the house. But uh, you just can't fail this course if you... Uh, follow the bouncing ball and do what you have to do. Uh, if anything, you'll find time will be your enemy on the exam. You've only got 90 minutes for these questions for each Part A and Part B. So do a time appreciation as you go into them. So we said this week we're going to go into uh, moving the ball along a little bit past strategy into uh, things like market entry strategy. And one of the key things you have to think about as strategist and you decide to go to China, the question is modes of entry. Um, and each mode in sort of increasing degree of risk of foreign direct investment, uh, starting with the easiest and very low risk, is simply the idea of, of exporting. Somebody calls up and says, Terry, can you send me a case of beer? I say, fine, put the money in my bank, I'll be glad to send the beer. Little or no risk. But as we move up from, ex from exporting into the, the idea of licensing, where I have to give you the license to Mum's Chocolate Cake, I think I showed that video in there, um, then there's some risk, you're going to steal or reverse engineer my, my recipe for the cake. And we keep on going up from franchising to um, uh, uh, joint ventures to 
wholly owned subsidiary, turnkey operations, wholly owned subsidiaries, and the last one is Greenfields, which is the most risk, and that's basically what it's, it, it implies. You go to this brand new field out there in the ground, and you put in your foundations, and you build and grow, and design the facility, the tools, just exactly the way you want it. But that comes at great cost, great risk, you own it all, and uh, you can do that model, rather than take, as we did here on the campus, uh, MBAs used to use the old garages as you come in the gate up at the top of the hill. Uh, they've been made over into classrooms, and the most terrible classrooms. They're long and narrow. It's very hard to get a, that, that sense of, con not control, but sense of engagement with uh, a long, thin line of, of students. And so uh, um, Greenfields is a nice way to go if you, if you can do it. But anyway, we're going to look at that this week, and, and in fact, um, I think I put in the bonus section, if you can't find it, let me know, but somewhere, or a slide, I've actually laid out the, uh, the modes of entry and the advantages and disadvantages of each. So as we go into the, uh, into the Royal Roads Goes Global case, that indeed would be one of the questions for Royal Roads. Do we want to simply uh, um, export some of our course material to uh, uh, a sister university in, say, China? Or do we want to do a licensing arrangement or some joint venture arrangement? Or Greenfields go over there and simply set up for the first time a Royal Roads institution in, in China? These are all considerations. Uh, the directing minds here had to go through, as you would have to in your organization, and look at the advantages and disadvantages in the ecosystem, the three C's, all the stuff we're talking about and are starting to resonate and mean something to you, uh, you'd have to do. And so that's what's on the, uh, on the case today. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is time now we looked a little bit at the Blue Ocean Strategy, and I put some slides together for a workshop in the course. Um, I put a link in there for you to have a look at, uh, and I'd like you to find some time to look at the YouTube link on what is Blue Ocean Strategy, Red Ocean, Blue Ocean, and it's simply what the name implies. It's a very short little clip, but Red Ocean is, uh, well, Royal Roads, again, using it as an example. When we first started out, and I was here then, back in the year 2000, we were just getting underway on the blended model for teaching, and that was quite unique in Canada. Uh, the regular institutions were traditional, Western and, and uh, Dalhousie and, uh, and, uh, and UBC, were the traditional models. You came, put your bum on that seat, and we talked to you for the full four months, and the course was over. But this idea of blending the, uh, harnessing the energy of the new innovation of the internet uh, with teaching and residencies, uh, that wasn't done in large measure. We weren't certainly unique. IMD and others around the world were doing it, but we were one of the first off the mark. And so as a result, we didn't go competing head-to-head -head and try to get market share from UVic and UBC and places like that, which would be the Red Ocean, uh, but rather we went off over in this field over here where there weren't any blended models. And as a result, it was no problem filling. 100 MBAs would come in and sign up right away because the model hit the right button of what the consumer wanted. Uh, you wanted the ability to stay at home and work and do your day job and zoom in and out a little bit on your own time and uh, guess in team base but, and, and complete it. But it was successful. And the danger of being successful, of course, is that it was easily replicated by the universities such as Western and others with deep pockets. And now most of these institutions have our same model. They do it as well. And so our ocean now is getting no longer blue ocean, but it's getting fierce. There are people competing for your business. Uh, and, and so what we have to do now is do this blue ocean strategy. Is there another field over here that it's, it's a blue ocean that the MBAs aren't competing in right now? Can we come up with some new models? And yes, I tell you we can. And so I'd like you to take some time today, or this week, to look at the Blue Ocean Strategy, look at those YouTube clip videos, um, and where you start, go back to one of the tools we looked at. It was the value proposition curve, and you may recall that, in essence, we had the, uh, for the uh, real estate, real, real to retail industry, um, all the important key success factors and attributes we ran across the bottom, that if you want to get into the, to be a Simpson Sears, or be an Eaton's, or to be a uh, Walmart, here are the important attributes you will need to be successful across the bottom. And then you put some metric up this on the side, and the metric is going to be simply low, medium, high. Uh, the metrics can come from a smart model uh, where you put those attributes and weight them as to importance, and then you get some real accuracy as to where to put these, these buttons, if you would, these points on your value proposition curve. Um, and on that particular curve, I don't want to mislead you, what I put on there was three particular um, generic strategies. You'll find a low-cost strategy, like a Costco. You'll find a, a differentiated strategy, and you'll find a, a, a mom-and-pop shop, which is kind of in, kind of in the middle. Uh, on your model, it'll just be the one. What strategy have you picked? 
And if you take, say, the low-cost strategy, then what are the important attitudes for low-cost strategy for your industry? Put them across the top, put your curve in here, what the industry sort of is doing, what you're doing. And then uh, I want you to sit down then at that point and look at the idea of, in the light of the Internet of Everything and what it's doing for us, are there places now that you can reduce that particular point down? Or can you increase it? Can you create a new point off over here? Um, can you find some efficiencies in it? And so look at that, uh, those four particular, uh, the little matrix that's in the, uh, in the workshop and start thinking about that. But I, 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 I won't guarantee, but I can tell you, if not necessarily on your team, wouldn't hurt to do that, but when you get back to your place of work with your colleagues uh, someday for an hour over brown bag lunch, uh, just sit and brainstorm for a few minutes as to where this new red ocean will be on that curve, things that haven't been done yet but are now capable of being done uh, with this new Internet of Everything that you know something about, and they might not be caught up quite as far along the line as you have. Anyway, it's worth doing. Have a look at it if you wouldn't mind. I think it makes sense. Um, what else? We've got my little points here to talk about. Foreign Affairs, can you call some? Yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about the... Uh, just introduce, if I can, a number of magazines. I get uh, Bloomberg's I enjoy very much. I subscribe electronically to The Telegraph in Britain. I gave up my Globe and Mail because it's the particularly the associate press in there. So uh, it just gets me angry when I read their, their materials. Um, Foreign Affairs, not a bad magazine. Um, and uh, I've had it for years. And, and the interesting thing in it is, is that you probably can't see it from there. But uh, I read from cover to cover. And I couldn't understand why. I mean, it had The Economist and et cetera, et cetera. And finally, it dawned on me. The print in here is like size 14, size 16 font, font with big white spaces. And the articles are six to seven pages. And so they're quite readable to pick it up, read that to essay and put it back down again. Again, you have to check the biases in here because the people who write it all come with their own, own perspectives and own point of view. But it's a great little subscribe magazine. As students, which you are, you get a very good rate right now on, from the uh, foreign affairs. I'm not trying to flog them, but I just mentioned to you. And this week caught my eye was the uh, was Venezuela's suicide, which is uh, lessons from a failed state. And I enjoyed reading about that because we've got so many failed states around the world right now. And, and my sense is if, if uh, this election doesn't go well, we'll have some more. Uh, but they took, took Venezuela and... and uh, I left my glasses home today, guys. I'm sorry. So I'm struggling a little bit, but at this point I can read the newspaper I'm having trouble with. Um, but they talk about uh, in the 70s, Venezuela was the, was the have-to country. It had a good health care, it was a democracy, had the support of the United States, they worked collaboratively, they had oil. Uh, everything was going along nicely at opposing parties, they had proper elections. Uh, it was uh, one of the poster children for, uh, for the, uh, for, for the uh, South, South America. The engine, of course, was Brazil. Um, but uh, then Hugo Chavez comes along, and the complete the tips, it goes this way, into a popular socialist country, and all of a sudden, the, the health care, the, uh, the, the currencies, people are starving down there. I had some numbers in here that, uh, if I can jump off right away, but the, uh, it, was, it was horrendous. The, the numbers are just off the top of my head. It was something like 68% of the people are... Uh, are starving less, not enough food to eat. They've lost over 25 pounds in the, in the past year. Uh, it's pretty horrendous uh, as we go through. Prices double every 25, 25 days. And they go on explaining the situation, how we got there and what the problems are and the inflation rates, etc., etc. But then they come down to what to do about it. And that's the challenge, yes, for strategists, but more for folks that think on the, on the international studies side of the house, but it does impact our strategies. I mean, the, the Monroe Doctrine, the Americans take the position that South America is their sphere of control. And uh, when uh, Chavez got very tightly involved with Cuba, which they did, uh, this thing seemed to go to hell in a handbasket down there. And so now the, the, almost the, the Venezuelans are asking for America to intercede. And of course, many Americans... Uh, quite a number, don't want to do that. You can see the danger, of course, of Americans going in there and forcefully trying to right the order and stop the starvation, get the human rights back and close down the military and what the military is doing. But the optics of that certainly aren't good. And so the question this week we might just talk about a little bit is the, uh, um, again, from a strategist perspective, is uh, Canada is part of this. We were sanctioning the Venezuelans. We joined in with the Americans to sanction. Today we're doing, we've done it. 
And so uh, should we be involved? And is there a role for Canada and the U.S. to play in, in sorting this mess out? Or do we just leave them to their own avails? The, the authors here leave us with the, the impression that not much can be done. It's just going to take time to play out, which means an awful lot of pain and suffering for very, very many people who are just can't do it. They're, they're migrating, as we see, coming north into the States, but also migrating to the other South American countries. And the other South American countries, just like the States, are starting to put their barriers up and saying, stop, we just can't take any more because there's only so many seats here in the lifeboat, you're going to destroy us. And so it's a real problem, like there is, is in Yemen, uh, what to do about it. So anyway, my, at the end of the day, what I'm saying to you is, have a look, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, Foreign Affairs is a good book to get. And uh, we talk a bit about Venezuela. The other thing I belong to is something called the Canadian uh, Institute Council, International the Canadian Inst International Council. There's one in every major city across Canada. Uh, they have meetings monthly, like the Rotary Club. They bring in top-notch speakers uh, to sit and talk over lunch about uh, important issues, but issues that will import, impact your business, your strategy, our nation. And if you're interested, you could look those people up. The uh, Canadian International Council uh, worth worth looking at. So today I've got some things just to fire at you, if I can. The, uh, you may recall back in 2015, the uh, Chinese Communist Party put together the idea of a one-child policy, and uh, that tended to be male. Somehow the, the females disappeared. And uh, it's now having a lot of blowback on what to do, because the, the demographics are such that the, they'll not go higher 1.4 billion. They've reached the top of their population. And the large bulk of these people up here are like the baby boomers. They're all in their 60s and older, and what to do about it. And the actual working force, the ones that are in their 20s, uh, currently is only 200,000 of them. And they think by 2030, that number will drop down to about, uh, not 200,000, 200 million, uh, will drop down to 150 million, which in a 1.4 billion, that's not an awful lot of people pulling on the oars. And it's not big enough to have that, that middle class that they need uh, to internally develop the market to sell their products to. They, they're dependent on Americans buying their products, and the dream was to build a middle class, which they have now but is dissipating, uh, to sell their products to internally so they wouldn't be quite so dependent externally on selling their products. And so we talk about unexpected incomes and what's happening with the... There is interesting. Um, this was an interesting piece uh, in, in New Zealand, a business down there called the Perpetual Guardian. Um, they started paying employees for just five days, for five days a week, but they only had to work four. Uh, but they're allowed to work um, on the weekend if they wished. Just get that balance of life. It was their choice, but they didn't have to come to work. They could work four days a week, work from home, whatever it happened to be. Um, but the interesting thing was is that they, they had to have surveillance of the employees. So you could work from home but they needed analytics and things, which are there now on your computer. I have analytics in this, this course. Uh, we, every time you enter the course, um, the record is kept. And so for every discussion site, all your posts, time spent on, et cetera, et cetera, and not quite down to keystrokes, but the analytics are there, and so it's very quick to do that. And so Big Brother is watching. And uh, they're, they're exploiting that opportunity down there for employees. And the employees like this idea of this at, at the surface level, less sort of command and control that I can do what I want to do. But the reality is at the second level, of course, um, there's lots of surveillance going on to make sure that you're actually doing your day job. So what do we do think about that for this week as a new, a new thought? I received an article in from Bill Archer, too. Bill Archer uh, was in one of the earlier classes who went through. A real great guy. I enjoyed working with Bill and uh, had a lot of good thoughts. Works for TELUS. And, uh, so, and he sent me an article, which was nice, about the... Uh, Food delivery apps are getting more popular. This idea that uh, people are still going out uh, for outdoor food and eating outdoor food, restaurant food, but they don't want to sit in the restaurant anymore. They want to zoom in, get a bag from a machine, get out, and take the bag home. And those numbers are up large percentages, and the restaurant side of actually sitting in a room is coming down. And so more and more apps and more and more restaurants are downsizing the, the space they hold in, again, in retail centers, because they don't need that large space, but they need is a kitchen and reduce size for those that want to stay, but the ability to actually externally to send this stuff out is interesting. And now they're going into bots, just the old vend food vend vending machines, that the bots are there, the bots are stacking the box, you're taking the money, and the bots are feeding you, and so it cuts down the labor cost. So they save on space for the restaurant in the, in the retail center, and they save on labor costs once the capital costs are, are getting to find a way to keep the restaurant prices 
down. But it's, it seems like an idea whose time is coming. Again, that, that, that red ocean that people hadn't been there, they're moving towards it nicely. And uh, some good stories in there. Um, another one here, again, we talk about the cyber warfare, the six domains of war. And uh, Britain has done a bit of a study. And they said that uh, Britain needs 50,000 uh, cyber army, they call it, in order to uh, f protect against the Russian proliferation of its hackers in coming, much that the Americans have been talking about um, uh, hacking attacks. In fact, I think somewhere early on in the course, one of the links I gave you was the hacking attack live going back and forth. Well, that's carrying on. All nations do it. Canada does it, Russia does it, and uh, America does it. Uh, but this is from a NATO advisor just warning Britain that uh, you've got to turn those people out. So we talk about unemployed truck drivers. Can they become uh, cyber warfare army uh, soldiers? And uh, that certainly is a question. If we can do that, if they can retool their jobs for them. If they can't, then they're going to have some problems because that avalanche is coming closer as we're discussing in this course. Um, another one that uh, popped out to mind was the uh, idea of the energy. I think it was the energy supply. Let me just check that for a second. Uh, my fat little fingers over here. Yeah, it was the National Grid. That was the story. The National Grid infrastructure, once again, these cyber attacks are coming in and they're prodding, just like the military in the old days sent out troops to prod the front line to find weaknesses and not divulge who found the weakness, just go back and record, we found an opening here and an opening there. That's happening all day long. It's happening on our nuclear power plants. It's happening on our grid system, both here in Canada and in the States. And I can tell you the system in, in North America, there our systems tend to be old. And... Uh, just to back up on that for a few minutes, I mean, the cost of putting in, and there's folks there who work for TELUS, in the old days, the numbers I had in the back of my head were something in the order of uh, um, close to $1,000 to put a landline in to everybody's home. The time you figure the infrastructure cost, the labor cost, the lamp hole, and the wires, hard wires in, and the servicing, whatever, uh, the cost was something in that order to have a landline put in. Well, the new nations, the new nations bursting out, nations like China, didn't have to go that infrastructure of putting lamp holes all the way around, over the whole country. They went to satellites and dropped it in, and so the cost of their phones is in several hundreds of dollars. You can see the competitive advantage they have on communication because we're still playing with the old system, and they've got the new system. And in the old system, it's fraught with dangers, and so the, the electronic grid um, is being prodded, and nuclear power stations are being prodded all over, but certainly in the States uh, by, by Russians and Chinese and, and North Korea, I'm sure, et cetera. Um, and so this is a warning here again that uh, we need to do something about that. The European Commission has talked because they've done another survey, another search, and they're saying we have to do something to get ready for the uh, potential attack on state sponsors attack and criminal organizations against power stations, electrical network, and essential systems. And that was from the Telegraph. And so uh, a good story. In fact, I, I digress a minute for EMPs. The Carrington event, about 100 and about 1850 sometime. But the Carrington event was one of those times when you have solar flares from the sun. And they happen all the time. We missed one about two years ago. It just grazed and went that way. It had to come this way. Uh, they have a tendency to fry electronics. And that's our, our eyes in the sky. All these satellites are susceptible to that. Cars that aren't the old-fashioned cars, anything has a computer chip in it, won't run. And so if we get one of these flashes come down, it'll take, I'm going to say years, it's going to take a long time to get us back up again. We'll be put back into the Stone Age uh, quite, quite quickly. And so we want to look about EMPs and what we can do to harden that. And I understand it can be hardened. The question is budgets. And uh, I think the opposition in both countries are fighting the idea of spending that sort of money to harden our, our systems. But it's something we have to look at. So we could talk a bit about EMPs. We could talk a bit about the uh, cyber warfare uh, potential coming up and our electronic grid system and the weaknesses found in that, all important to us. Um, polling stations, the same thing here. Job applications, CV, what was that all about? Um, yeah, we've not done that enough now. Um, the doctors came up this week. We talked about doctors and certainly the problems of BC, but it's common across Canada, there's not enough medical support for for Canadians, for the 35 million Canadians. We don't have enough. And so we're, we're going out to clinics, and it's uh, catch as you catch can, and there's no sort of holistic view of you as the patient, but rather it's whoever happens to see you that day, and 
to what extent within 15 minutes they can get a grasp on who you are and diagnose correctly what your challenges are. And if they misdiagnose, of course, then you get the wrong solution. And so it was quite troubling for the, uh, for the outcomes of this thing. And we talked in terms of a tiered system uh, with triage, where you come through first some super qualified nurses to weed out the easy cases and just the hard ones get back into the back room with the doctors. There's things like that, but we could do all those things and tinkering with the system, but it occurred to me that the other side of the equation on a demand supply curve, of course, is the supply of doctors. And I think what's happened here, and, and uh, I stand to be corrected, but open for discussion this week, is that we have a, uh, an association, a medical association, that are gatekeepers. They very much have a great input through lobby, through support uh, for the ruling powers, the ruling parties. Uh, they're listened to. Uh, they have lots of clout. Uh, they have lots of clout with the Ministry of Health on, on setting salaries and things. And uh, so between those folks and the universities that have the doctor's seats, let's say 75 seats, for example, for medicine this year, um, and the budget I'll talk about from the, from the provincial government, there's a challenge here in trying to get more doctors out of the system. So starting with the, the university putting a cap on the number of seats, there's a lineup people want to get in to become doctors. I'm sure you all know of your neighbor's children and that who have applied and couldn't get in because there's only 75 seats or 125 seats, whatever the number happens to be. <coughs> and those seats are are divided up first on so many will be filled by external, from out of, out of country, get those seats. Then so many be in from Newfoundland, so many in from PEI, so many from Ontario, they allocate seats that way as well. And then so many be gender, males and females, that'll be done. So the, that, sh that, that young person living next to you in your house in BC, applying for medical school, may be competing for only 25 seats uh, out of the 125. And so uh, we've got the talent People want to do it. We just won't let them have the seats to come out the other end of the system. Um, part of that, I suspect, is that uh, doctors want to keep their salaries up, want to keep the blueberry patch just for them. So we, there's a lot of external blockages from attracting, retaining immigrants to come in and fill those seats and the retooling they have to do to, to get permission to come into the system. Um, and so we'd, we, we could look a bit at that this week and see, is, is that appropriate? Can we somehow break the stranglehold? Can we open up that floodgate a little bit to get some of these doctors in? The other part of the story, of course, is that the ministry's got a budget, I think it's in this province, around, say, $18 billion, and uh, hard-pressed to get more money because we're tax fatigues here now. They've got to make do without that basket they have. But I think if they revert to the supply-demand curve, and as they did in Cuba, there's lots of doctors down there, um, as they did with the law, lawyers in this, this country, well, 30 years ago, they opened up the floodgate. We've got lawyers now on every street corner. You want a lawyer, it's not hard to find one. In fact, they're out looking for you to give you their card. Um, and so if you, and when's the last time a doctor passed you a business card saying, come see me? And so if we look at the demand supply curve that Adam Smith talked about in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations, I think we could look at that and uh, Maybe that's the way to solve this. It may, it'll be a difficult transition period for maybe 10 years where well, this shakes through the system. But I think the cost of medicine will come down. Uh, the cost of doctors' salaries will come down. And that frees up more doctors to, uh, to help. Right now, the doctor goes through the system and gets a GP ticket, but immediately goes on to a specialty because there's a demand for specialists. And that's where the money is. And so uh, not too many GPs are left to do it. Anyway, we could look this week at that, about medical supplies and doctors and gatekeepers, and what do we think about that? Um, article in here by Boris Johnson, um, British fellow, talking about free speech, and uh, he said, we need a campaign for free speech to take on the professionally offended. And uh, he says uh, that the Internet has created a bruised, easy generation that's intolerant of people speaking out of turn. And he goes on and gives illustrations of uh, universities, particularly in the States, of, uh, you just have to be careful what you say. And he thinks the time has come that we need to get a bit thicker skin and we should be have those discussions. In this class, I think we do, but uh, uh, he's talking about just generally uh, but uh, and, uh, and the abuse they take. So anyway, that's uh, was some, some of the stuff. Let's go to the paper and say that the caveat, I'm doing my best to read it, but uh, China's human rights pops up, front page of the paper, uh, shows a big giant picture of a prison with razor barbed wire fence over it, and it's... Uh, it's on the west side of China, right out by Turkmenistan, um, Uzbekistan, that sort of area there. So the Mongolia's over here, so it's right at the very tip over here, uh, north of Tibet, that uh, they take all the Muslims from China and ship them over to there, which is 
it's like Siberia, it's like us shipping up to uh, past Inuvit somewhere even farther north, and that's where they house them uh, for this uh, political indoctrination to uh, get them in line with the Chinese party. And so uh, we could look at human rights in China and the, uh, this particular challenge, but on a larger issue, again, human rights that we have to deal with and what role should we have in Canada? Should we be, as a young upstart country, should we be pushing for human rights? Uh, right now, we just had that session with the uh, with the Saudis and uh, business and giving up $15 billion in, in supplies uh, to uh, try to convince them to be better on human rights. Um, is that our job? Andrew Stronick, son of Frank Stronick. Frank was uh, an entrepreneur, set his own business up called Magna Corporation, did extremely well from, from the get-go, starting just in small little local garages, clusters like Sleeman's, a bunch of local garages, and kept on going until finally end up with the state well over uh, a business well over a billion dollars, and uh, and uh, it went to his sister in trust to run for a bit, uh, the company, and uh, now the children of that, they're having a bit of a family fight. So I guess what flows of that interesting to us is the idea, of, again, of succession planning and having this sort of clear in our own affairs, and I encourage you last week to have a look at uh, at David McLean's video, uh, Succession Planning and Small Family Business that has grown equally in size. Um, might be interested to look at. Um, Ontario uh, prisons still rely on solitary confinement. This was uh, not a good thing. It, it goes on about the uh, a study done on the on the prisons and uh, putting people in solitaire, and they put one uh, Muslim prisoner um, in jail for my eyes don't work entirely. I think that it says 835 days, almost three years in solitaire. You can't do that. Um, and then they went on and talked other illustrations of, but on an average, all prisoners are getting more time in solitaire as a, as a means to bring them into line. And uh, so we could talk about prisons, but maybe we could zoom out for a few minutes. This is a symptom. Why don't we zoom out for a few minutes and talk about the prison system as a whole? Um, I contend that prisons are an industry in Canada. It's a tool, it's an industry. We have criminal lawyers, we have prisons, maintenance of prisons, heat, light, phone, pensions, workers for prisons, social workers, for prisons, welfare people for prisons. Uh, it is a large business. Indeed, in the States, uh, we talk about, and one of the things we're going to talk about in here, and there's a, in the bonus section you'll find more, I, I did consulting for public-private partnerships for almost 30 years, and uh, some of the thoughts are in there, and some slides that we'll touch upon briefly, um, public-private partnerships, just the very basic. Um, but the interesting thing is, in America, they have actually taken, and it's not a panacea for everything, but in America they've actually taken public-private partnerships for a large number of their prisons. They give them to you and I to run. We bid on them, and now it becomes my prison. And uh, in return for that, they guarantee they'll take so many bed spaces. Well, you can see the challenge there, of course, is that if they can't fill the bed spaces, they still pay me. And so what we get down there is a lot of blacks, uh, unfortunately, the uneducated, ones who can't afford lawyers. Um, and so those sort of folks that are, uh, are, are on the street are picked up, scooped, and for the least of crimes are incarcerated down there to fill bed spaces. And so as a result, America has the liest, highest uh, incarceration rate of any other country in the world. And Canada's not too far behind. But uh, I think P3s are part of the villain down there. And we've got to do better. We've got to find some ways around to, to uh, take these folks and... Uh, and rebuild them and get them back into the society and, 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 and delivering um, and contributing to, to the system. So anyway, uh, this week we could talk a bit about P3s. Do you recommend that in Canada? Should we follow the American model? Um, is it an industry and can we prune that industry back by being more sensible? Uh, now marijuana is off the list, but uh, and Trudeau to his credit, is, is it, it's going to reduce those folks going to the can. Um, but what other things can we do to cut down this industry and bring it down into size and put those people doing something more productive for our GMP than uh, taking care of uh, people being incarcerated? Anyway, that's the story there. P3s, Canada, should we have them? Uh, even, I guess, even from a social justice point of view that, um, as they say, the, the rich seem to be able to, to find a way around the obstacle, uh, particularly if you're a Democrat in the States. Um, but certainly the, the downtrodden, the poor, the people living on the streets in downtown Victoria, um, the, the medical, the, the legal system is not, 
you know, student aid and and and, and uh, bless their hearts and my colleagues, they do what they can do, but they they're no match for um, lawyers with deep pockets and uh, uh, well skilled in the in the in the profession. Anyway, worth looking at. Toronto human rights lawyer warns about artificial intelligence isn't designed for use in immigration, and she goes on to explain why about the empathy in that, and it may have biases in the machine, and we've already seen biases in AI, and uh, certainly the Google um, uh, programs they put in place to filter out what they deem to be offensive uh, are all shaped on biases uh, that they bring to the table and putting it in, and we've talked in this class about we all have biases, right wing Attila the Hun, we all have biases. And so she's saying when it comes to uh, human rights uh, for immigration, um, can't use machinery. You have to have a person doing that. Do you think that's true, or do you think the person still comes with biases? Worth a challenge. Stats Canada, this one drove me crazy. Stats Canada uh, plans to attract personal banking as a result of increasing unreliable surveys. So uh, Stats Canada is looking for permission to track every one of your dollars. Where are you going? Where are you spending it? Uh, what are you spending it on? Um, your credit card's the same thing. There's another article in here we'll talk about the credit card companies doing exactly the same thing, almost collaboratively the same thing. They want to know every penny you spend, and it's your money, but they need to know what you're doing with your money. And so there's some pushback from some folks. I haven't noticed an awful lot in our local papers, but uh, certainly uh, I don't think SATSCAN and the government should have any involvement with what you do with your money. Simply send us a bill for what you need. The rest of it is ours. Poking the bear. Am I gone too far? Should they have the right to look at your money? Um, Yemen. Um, mass casualties. Com combat intensifies. Recall Yemen down there just south of Saudi, about 100 some odd miles away from, from Mecca. Um, sits on one of the borders of the two choke points in the Middle East for oil. Uh, particularly, it's got a, a post there. Baba, I think it's called the... the the choke point and coming up to the Suez, and the other one is the Gulf of Hormuz that comes up and the Iran's over here. Uh, those two choke points are very critical. Well, over here we have the uh, Yemen battles going on, and uh, in particular the the Houthi are down there, uh, funded in large part by the Iranians, and uh, the Yemen people are caught in the crossfire, and so they're sustaining great injuries, great damage, children, etc., and. Uh, the equipment that the Americans have given the Saudis, the equipment that Canada has given the Saudis, uh, is very much in play and being used. Um, not skillfully, uh, from what I read. Uh, the Houthi are doing remarkably well with just sort of uh, slingshots and rifles and flip-flops, but the, uh, a lot of people are getting collateral damage hurt in the, in the way. So we could talk a little bit about there, and maybe again, it's, should Canada be supplying weapons? Should we be in the weapons business? Um, should we, in fact, maybe we could roll that back a little bit Canada, at one point, were the quintessential peacekeepers back in the 60s when, uh, when, uh, uh, hmm, wore a bow tie. Pearson. Pearson started up, Lester Pearson started up the uh, uh, peacekeepers in any meaningful way. Canada transitions. We were still a fighting force coming out of World War, I, World War II and, and uh, well appreciated that and they had a good sized army in those days. But we morphed over doing an awful lot of peacekeeping roles and we were good at it and people recognized we were good at it. And it gave us a certain panache globally, some intellect, some, 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 some capital, if you would, by other nations that looked at Canada as a good country trying to do the right thing. And now we've morphed back a little bit away from peacekeeping, more into uh, uh, support and being part of the coalition of the willing. And I think we may have given up some of this uh, bright, shiny star that we were wearing for one point. So the question is peacekeeping and what should be the role of our, our military? Um, and here's an article here about the uh, largest uh, debt and credit card payment processor in the country is doing the same thing that Stats Canada wants to do. It's monitoring everything that goes on your card and analyzing it because they need more data about you. It's scary stuff, this Orwellian 1984 stuff. Oh, this was fun. Um, Ottawa has put back in place a uh, a uh, support for venture capital companies. They have gone through and looked at good venture capital companies across Canada, ones who have a track record, have been successful in putting some of their money on the line to other companies, startups, and help those startups get uh, 
get underway and do well. And so they've selected uh, half a dozen of these things that are good companies, and now they've given them $50 million, and they, they can draw it down and get this money, so the venture capitalist will put up $2.25 for every dollar from the feds to put together to give to these startup companies. And I think it's a good project to get the uh, get these things up and started, uh, incubators up and on the, on the way. Bank of Montreal and ICBC um, say they don't expect to make credit restrictions to the energy sector. And recall, with the price of oil falling down and the glut we have and the, uh, some of the challenges that the oil companies are facing right now, um, it's important in the line of credits and what's going on. And so the Bank of Montreal and CIBC said that uh, we don't expect but certainly that's a message to all of us at this point. There's a bank tightening up taking place. And what for what? What do they see out in front of us that they feel they have to do that? Certainly the oil industry there's some, but is there also tightening coming on the on just the general lines of credit and things like that? We have people in our course here that, that are right in the industry and I appreciate hearing what they see out there six months down the road. Are they getting ready for Trump to lose? And uh, I didn't get into that today, but that's the other thing. The time you see this, this is Monday, um, Trump's election is tomorrow night. Uh, you'll be seeing this next Monday. It'll all be over. Uh, but I still would like to kick it around as to what the outcome of that election will mean to Canada. And by then, of course, we'll know good, bad, or indifferent. But I'm wondering how much of this is is uh, impacted there. Well, just a few more things. We'll call it a day. Um, yeah, Cuba's lowering its... Uh, Cuba's lowering its economic growth rate. Uh, it's struggling a little bit, but not surprisingly. So a uh, number of the countries around the world are all struggling right now, and that's the, the engine is America holding it up. Um, we'll have to wait and see how this thing goes tomorrow night. Well, folks, I think that's what I want to cover today. I've given you some good materials to kick around. Uh, add anything else you want to add. Certainly the discussion sites are really rich. I'm enjoying what I'm getting. Hopefully you are too. There's good materials in there. Burn a copy, take it with you. That's it for now. See you next week. Bye-bye.